Welcome everyone to Rewind, Recap, Relive, where legends and rising stars meet. I'm your host Jonah and we're here today bringing you a really, really great interview with the frat boy or frat daddy depending, Bryce Cannon, coming on with the extreme horseman, the enforcer. C.W. Anderson. I love this interview so much. There's some great advice thrown around in here. We hear about some ECW original stories, some questionable New Jack spots, uh, Bryce Cannon's frat boy persona working with the big LG Luke Gallows, talking shop mania moments, and so much more. So stay tuned for that. But first, let's get into the announcement for our next episode. So next Thursday, there should be a great collaboration dropping on the channel. But in two weeks, we will have our next guest. And I want to try something a little different. I want you guys to look out for the next guest announcement, the next two guests, of course, announcement on our Twitter at R3Jonah. And you can look at our Instagram at Rewind Recap Relive. We'll post it there. But in two weeks' time, we will have another great interview for you guys. And I want you to look out for the announcement on our social media platforms. And look out next Thursday for a great collaboration. And that takes care of everything. All that's left for you guys to do is enjoy this interview with C.W. Anderson and Bryce Cannon. Didn't even mention at the beginning because he just won it. Bryce Cannon is the current LPWG Lionheart Champion. What an accomplishment out of the Lariato promotion. C.W. Anderson, of course, tells us that he is stepping back in the ring in this interview and he can't wait to continue his future. Listen, it's a great interview. I'm putting it over enough. I want you guys to enjoy it. And please go down below and smash that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Smash that notification bell. Ding, ding, ding. So you don't miss a thing here on Rewind, Recap, Relive. Share this around. Let everybody know you're watching C.W. Anderson and Bryce Cannon. Trust me, they'll ask you where you're watching it and they will follow suit. I guarantee that. So make sure you enjoy this great interview. Check back on our social medias for our guests in two weeks and check back next Thursday for a fantastic collaboration. I'll see you soon. Our first guest is a rising star coming to us from Georgia, the Lariato promotion. He's got four years running in the business and is the current LPWG Lionheart champion. Please welcome straight from his daddy's yacht, frat boy, Bryce Cannon. That's right. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, we are happy to have you here. And you can run, but you can certainly not hide from our next guest. He is a legend in the industry, having made his name known worldwide. WWE, ECW, of course, he's an ECW original. Please welcome the extreme horseman, the enforcer, C.W. Anderson. What's up, man? Yo, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Awesome to have you both here. And I'd love to always start at the beginning of both of your careers and learn how it is you got into professional wrestling. Uh, Bryce, can we start with you? What was it? What was your first uh, experience of pro wrestling like? Um, wrestling has been in my family forever. Uh, I'm a first generation wrestler. Um, no one in my family has ever done it. They looked at me cross-eyed whenever I said I was actually going to start getting into the business. Um, but I used to go down to a place in uh, Georgia called Fort Valley. And um, they used to have a uh, wrestling called AWN, All-Star Wrestling Network. And we would always go down there. They would pack this little flea market out uh, every night. And it was just a great thing. And I remember one specific guy, his name was the Underfaker. And uh, he used to scare me to death because he would come out to Taker's entrance. The dongs would happen and everything like that. And um, it, But he was a gimmick character because he would do like the clap on, clap off for the lights and everything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once it would get in the ring, it would lighten up. But uh, I just remember, you know, just being super entertained and like just awestruck about these guys and like, man, like th this is so cool. And then finally, I was old enough to start watching it on TV and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I uh, how I actually got in the business, I went with a friend of mine after I graduated high school and I saw a buddy of mine actually in the ring. And I was like, whoa, wait, wait a second. And so I text him after the uh, show and everything. And I, I just asked him, I was like, yo, how do you get into this? I, I've got to be a part of this. I've loved this my whole life. Like me and my brothers, we used to do this on the trampoline. I once got 12 stitches right here because I hit my buddy in the oh, head wow. with a chair and it bounced right back and <laughs> cut me right there. Um, but yeah, from there on, he, he just responded, uh, come next Sunday and we, we do training, see if you like it. So I took my first bump, and from there on, 
it's just been full sail. I, uh, I went to a seminar with Francisco Chiazzo um, in Sylvester, Georgia. Um, and I, by that time, I had maybe taken three bumps the whole time because I didn't bump around a lot in that first training session. But it was a WWN tryout, and um, Logan Creed was there. Uh, Mike Payne, just some Georgia names. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I actually rode down with Logan, and uh, that word got to me a couple weeks back and said that I would have won the tryout if I had experience in the business. Francisco didn't believe that I had uh, <laughs> had no experience yeah. prior to that. Uh, Cause there That's were guys quite the compliment though. Wow. Yeah, no, yeah. it's, it got my confidence. Uh, from Francisco. Yeah. It got my confidence super up. Um, but I mean, and especially because there were guys that had been trained by Jay lethal and like actual names at that seminar. And he's the one that was like, this kid would have won if, uh, if you yeah. know, he would have had experience behind his belt. But from there on, it's just been, you know, full sail going, you know? Yeah. Oh, a fun ride. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and CW, how about yourself? I heard you didn't actually grow up a fan. You want to talk about your experience with pro wrestling? <laughs> no, I actually hated pro wrestling growing up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, everybody that knows, knows knows my story and everything, I was a baseball prodigy growing up. Uh, I was a catcher, drafted, drafted by the San Diego Padres in 1989. Um, but I think how I fell in love with pro wrestling is, you know, during my time, I grew up in the 80s. Uh, I was a huge fan of Saturday Night Live. Well, my little brother Kevin was a huge NWA fan because we grew up east of Raleigh, North Carolina. Still live in the area today. And um, I remember one day, and, and I even said this yesterday in one of my interviews, that the match is on YouTube. Uh, Ricky Morton actually posted it on his Instagram, the finish of that match, and it was July of 1985. And he told me, my brother told me, he said, sit down and watch this one match with me if you don't like it. Uh, I'll never ask you to watch wrestling with me again because he always wow. got get me and my move my arm because my Rottweiler is licking me. She wants to play. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's she's being really needy right it's now. Funny you just but, said um, that because I was reading your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I actually, I'll, I'll get into this name a little bit later. But I just this is a, one of my new this is my newest design that my buddy gives. But um, he uh, I sat down with him and it happened to be that match. It was the Rock and Roll Express versus the Russians, Ivan Koloff and Crusher Khrushchev. And Ricky Morton pinned Uncle Ivan by a victory roll. And I remember my brother and I was 14 at the time. And and we were jumping around, hollering and screaming. And we were going crazy, just like the fans in the arena. Yeah. And I was I watched wrestling, but I still – I kind of got into it when I was like 16 and some backyard stuff. But uh, when my baseball coach found out I was doing that, he quickly cut that out. <laughs> he was like, you, know, you got a chance to go pro. <laughs> So let's cut it all on the, on the pro wrestling. But uh, when I got out of college or got my mom talked me out of going pro, she was the type that, you know, she was a mother hen and said, you know, you need to go to school. The pros will always be there. Hindsight being 20, 20, being a 17, 18 year old kid that never went anywhere or done anything. I should have went to the pros because, yeah. you know, you know, they drafted, they drafted Brad Ausmus after me and, you know, he's a hall of famer and stuff like that because hell I was better than what he was. Um, but I mean, you never know. Things worked out for like it is. But yeah. uh, I got into wrestling af in college when I saw a buddy of mine at McDonald's one day, and he was actually doing some independent stuff. And asked him what he was doing. He said, I'm, you know, I'm doing that and in doing some wrestling. And it was in a town nearby. He said, we got a show this weekend. Why don't you come and get in the ring with us and, you know, see if you like it. So I got there, got there early, got in the ring, rolled around and caught that bug. And it just took off from there. I never really got formally got trained until I got to the power plant. I was just kind of learning as I go. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's such an interesting experience. I definitely want to touch on that. I'm interested. Did you ever uh, tell Ricky about that? I'm sure you have right over the years that he he his match got you hooked like that. Every you? time we we talk about that, there's a couple of stories. I, two of my that and Ricky actually tells these in his seminars. The first one was you know that story about how I got in the you know what made me fall in love with pro wrestling. But the very first time I worked Ricky Morton, um, you know I'm fresh in the business and I'm. I, was and still am a huge Bobby Eaton mark and I was I wanted to do like the leg drop off the top rope and yeah. all this crazy shit and hit Ricky with a spine buster and all this and Ricky goes look CW I'm going to tell you tonight we're going to go out there and I'm going to work your little finger and I'm going to get over more working your little finger than you are doing all that crazy shit well I didn't know any better <laughs> on the outside I'm like yeah Ricky yeah sure whatever you say sir and on the inside I'm like there's no way and I'll be damn he didn't prove me wrong we went out there, he worked my finger, the crowd was going eight shit over it. And 
all that stuff I did, it was like crickets. So that was a valuable lesson learning wow. for, for the Ricky the first time. And I remember about four years ago, I'm sitting in the locker room in Clayton, which is down the road from where I'm living at. And, you know, I'm sitting in the locker room and Ricky and Robert are sitting on to the left of me and Barry Dorsal, who Barry Dorsal, who was Crusher Khrushchev, was sitting to the right of me. I'm thinking, shit, three to four guys that I fell in love with pro wrestling is right. I'm sitting right beside. So, you know, I'm, I'm just that little mark on the inside thinking about that. <laughs> Oh, for sure. That's so, that's so cool. I love the, yeah, Ricky's, Ricky's phenomenal. That's a great story though. It sounds just like him because we had him on the show and he was so forthcoming, just amazing mind for yeah, the Ricky's business. Ricky's awesome. Yeah. Um, so Bryce, just while it's fresh in your mind, I know that championship we mentioned at the beginning, the LPWG Lionheart Championship, you just won that last night, right? Was yeah, last uh, night? Saturday night. Oh, Saturday night. Yeah, okay, yeah. Saturday night, yeah. You want to talk about that match? Yeah, it was actually a... Uh, a pretty big one for me um, just because this is my first singles title. So uh, I'm super proud of it. Um, it hasn't really sunk in yet. It, it sunk right. in a little bit on the ride home. I was like, wow, like, okay, I'm actually, you know, getting noticed somewhat. And I think what did it for me is the fact that uh, Gallows, it's his promotion. Um, it's Doc Gallows promotion. So it's like, right. you know, that's kind of like the little rub, you know, just a small one. But, um, yeah, I, I got to be in the ring um, kind of full circle, like I mentioned Logan Creed earlier. Uh, I got to work with Logan Creed, Ziggy Dice, and then uh, Fry Daddy. Uh, you know, Logan, right. MLW, you got Ziggy Dice, NWA Power, and then you've got Fry Daddy, who was on NXT a couple times. Um, so, it, like, I look back at it as like, wow, like, I, I'm being trusted, you know, see what I can do with the big dogs. And I definitely proved myself. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, CW can talk about this too. I mean, th this one's a hard business. I mean, you've got people that talk down to you all the time and tell you that you're nothing, um, especially when you first start out. But uh, I just kind of brush it off. I've got thick skin, which you've got to have in this business. But yeah, that match meant a lot to me just because of the eyes that were there. The, um, <clears throat> one of the gentlemen that, uh, that I give my credit for this uh, for wrestling, Michael Stevens, uh, marvelous Michael Stevens. He's known around the Indies. Um, he, he's the one who trained me actually in the AWN building. So uh, in Forsyth, or no, excuse me, Fort Valley, like I was tell, telling you all about. Um, he was there. Uh, Gallows was there. Anderson, uh, Eric Young, you know, just guys that have just a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge. Um, and just to share the ring with those guys was pretty cool. So uh, definitely one of my the moments that I'm marking down um, as like top ten. That's so cool to hear. And to go right into your training, then how how was training for you? Uh, you mentioned taking your first bump and and you were hooked. Was it hard to get the grasp on it though on professional wrestling for you? Um, <laughs> that's a funny story. <laughs> I, I don't want to sound like I'm gloating at all, but not really, because at at the point I was always the guy who watched wrestling to see the background stuff. I always looked at what the crowd was looking at. I, I didn't necessarily right. pay attention to everything that was going on. I was looking at the, uh, the gear the guys were wearing, you know, oh, does this person have rhinestones? What, what kind of gear does this person have? Oh, look, that turnbuckle's messed up right there. Oh, that fan just did this. I was always the one looking in the back. So yeah. at the same point, I started studying like the psychology of everybody, even though I had no idea what was going on because I hadn't had formal training as a teenager. I started looking at the stuff that kind of like matter, like, okay, I noticed they're working the left arm a lot. I noticed that he sets up for a suplex this way. I see that he's getting him in this, this hold this way. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like I said, me and my brothers, we would wrestle on the trampoline all the time. And so I kind of just took that in the ring with me. I was like, okay, I know this is not going to be a, um, a trampoline, but let's do this. So I remember the guy, you know, he taught me, uh, you know, throw your arms out. And he's like, I'm going to get behind you so you bump correctly. And I was like, no, 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 no. I, I want to do this myself. Because uh, anybody that starts training, you know, you want your feet up and everything whenever you first start. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so re training for me wasn't that hard. The thing that I had the issue with was working with other people that I wasn't familiar with. The trust, the trusting process. Because some of the guys that I trained with, Oof. they they did not look very uh <laughs> trustworthy yeah but um but yeah once I did that seminar it really clicked with me like okay I've got something going here and it just gave me a new confidence to take training a little more serious 
and uh, work out a little harder and, uh, you know, make sure that if this is what I'm going to do, I've got to do it. No one can do it for me. Right. That's a great, that's a great outlook. And CW, how about you? You have any thoughts on that? Because your experience was just so unique. Uh, as you mentioned, no formal training. So let's hear it. Right. Um, you're always going to have people that doubt you, you know, so I've been doing this 27 years and my, you know, even my, my mom, she, she was happy when I re- did that retirement BS over the summer. And now she, <laughs> you know, she's never really liked me wrestling. And, you know, one of the biggest ones that, one of the biggest things that shot me down was when I was at the power plant and JJ Dillon and Paul Warndorf told me I didn't really have what it take to make it in this business. You're always in, you know, my entire career, I always help tell people you're not a real Anderson. Well, shit, jackass, none of us are, as you know, it's usually my response. Um, so you're always going to have those people that's going to tell you, you can't make it. You're not going to be any good. You have to believe in yourself. You have to be your own worst critic. You have to, critique yourself i mean shit i still watch matches i did 20 years ago and i'm looking at it, i'm like why in the hell did i do that i just watched yeah. one the other day from one i think it was either i think it was me and kid cash from november to remember and i'm looking i'm like why did i do this and no, there's shit i can never go back and change it but i still get mad at myself because i'm my worst critic and that's i think that's what helped me succeed was you can't tell me that I, you can tell me i did this wrong that's the way i wanted to learn never be too arrogant to where you don't take criticism. I got a lot of guys for some of the promotions I work for when I critique their match, I'm very hard on them. And I tell them what they did wrong, not what they did right. And they've actually gone to the promoters and cried to them to an extent. And they're actually no longer with us because they can't take my criticism. They want to be patted on the back. They want to listen to the fans. And I say, well, if you listen to the fans long enough, sooner or later, your ass is going to be sitting out there with them. So you have to take criticism because that's the way you learn. I am a manipulator, not a manipulator, but I fine tune and I nitpick. Uh, and that's the only way you get better is by trying to be perfect in a match. And you take that through your career, you know, yeah. belts are going to come and go. And it's great that guys are trusting you uh, with this belt. So early in your career and with Gallows and Anderson in there, who I respect a, a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a big thing. You know, I worked Dick Zicky last year at NWA. I know Logan. I mean, so, it's, that's a huge accomplishment for you, but take this win and stride and do, and take it as a stepping stone and get better. Look at people, send them their match, send me your match. Say, Hey, what did I do wrong in this match? Yeah. Tell me what I did wrong. Don't tell me what I did right. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. That, I'm definitely noting that for sure. Cause like, like you said, watching matches, that's what I do. I don't really watch the other guy. I'm watching me. And uh, I actually watched the match from Saturday night back. As good of a match as it was, I did see a couple of things that I was like, oh, I should have done this. I, I shouldn't have put my knee down right here. Because if you know Logan, Logan's a tall guy. And mm-hmm. he hit the scorched earth on me, uh, I, you know, full Nelson face bump. I put my knee out because I was kind of scared of being that high. And I was like, oh, man. But luckily, I, Look. I talked to Logan about it. He was like, no, man, you took it great. I was like, all right, if you say so. Like, I knew yeah, in my I get- head. I'm one of those in a match. I – as soon as something happens, I'm like, oh, man. And that's where my mind goes. But, uh, yeah, I, I definitely like that advice. Well, one of the things that when I got to the power plant, you know, when you ask these people, what have I done wrong? Tell me one thing I can work on. You know, when I was at the power plant, I was lucky enough that Lodi was one of my former students. And I got to hang out at Raven's house a lot when Lodi was uh, Raven's flock, Raven's nest, whatever you call it, WCW. Yeah. So one night I'm hanging out at Raven's house and DDP comes over. And that's the first time I'd ever met DDP. And I said, you know, my name's Chris Fryatt. I'm training at the power plant. I wrestle with C.W. Anderson. I said, if you could give me one bit of advice that would have helped me throughout my career, what would it be? And he said, if you think you're going slow, slow down more. Um, and I've kept that and used that in my career. And I've also, one of the things was, uh, one of the things that I had a hard time doing was selling. Because, you know, guys with no hair, you have to over-exaggerate your sale. When I think I'm selling, I'm not really. So I would go out every match and work on my selling until I got became second nature. And then I would take the next thing and work on that until I perfected that. You take like, if you can't throw a punch, you work on your punches until you perfect them. And then you work on your kicks and then you work on sending people off the ropes until everything becomes second nature. And after a while, it, it'll take you from a level of say less 25 and b- bump you up to 50. That's how you progress. Yeah. CW, for your first match, not having that formal training, what was going through your head at that time? Were, were you nervous or did you feel like you had it? 
John, I still get nervous today. But <laughs> it, it, even even then, yeah, I didn't know it was one of you go in the back and you know, not having the training. I'm sitting there and I'm looking in the in the in the uh, locker room and there's Jimmy Boogie Wigger Man Valiant, there's Wahoo yeah. McDaniel, and there's Ricky Morton, and I'm looking, and I'm sitting there watching them go over to match, and I'm like, holy hell, this is work. And it finally started hitting me, and I I wrestle under a mask, and I. I, I'm sure it was the drizzling shit. To be honest with you, I'm sure it was horrible because I didn't know what I was doing. But yeah. yes, I was very nervous, and even afterwards, I was nervous. And still, you know, when you stop getting nervous, it's time to get out of the ring. Yeah, because you're not yeah. doing yourself any justice. But yeah, man, I, I I thought I knew what I was doing until you go back and look at it, and then once you get better, you look go back and look, and you're like, okay, shit, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But that's <laughs> the only way you learn. That's the only way you get better. Right. <laughs> Uh, and so, Bryce, for you, uh, something specific. I know you worked on both Talk and Shop Manias, right? With yeah. the Good Brothers and many other talents, which is such a cool experience. Uh, how was that for you? That was uh, that was an experience for me. Just uh, you, like like C.W. Anderson said uh, earlier, you know, he, he kind of sat back and he's like, oh, my God, these are guys that I've watched. Uh, the guy that I kind of I, – I didn't really mark out on the outside, but on the inside I was just like, Holy cow! I'm I'm literally in the same room as Chavo Guerrero. That was the guy for me because that was one that I grew up like Latino Heat and everything like that. Right? Um, yeah. Holy cow! Like I ended up getting a picture with him and I posted it on my uh, personal page, and all of my friends were like, "No way! You're hanging out with Chavo!" And I I was just like, "Yeah, somehow, so this this crazy business has led me to meet these guys that I've I've seen on TV. I watched on TV forever." But like guys like Rhino, Scott Steiner, um, yeah. uh, Rock and Roll Express were there, uh, which gave me some some cool opportunities as well. Because talking Chopper Mania, uh, I actually lived in the Atlanta area at the time, and I uh, I went over to um, Robert's school and uh, trained there for a little bit before I I moved home because of COVID. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, it just opened up a lot of doors, and it was an opportunity that you know. I thank Gallows for a lot. Um, you know, the first one was kind of hectic because you just had all of these brothers over at the house, not knowing what we're doing. There, there wasn't no script of, Hey, this match is next. This one's here you go. It was just a, all right, your guys is up. And you're like, I haven't even laced my boots yet. What do you mean? We're up. Said, well, the <laughs> camera's rolling. Let's go. Uh, yeah. second, but the second one was definitely more professional, more, uh, right back. But, uh, it was just a cool experience because at that time it was, you know, the first one, especially COVID was still new. Gallows and Anderson had just, you know, practically got released from WWE. It was still a couple mm-hmm. of months afterwards, but um, it was, it was just cool to see how like those guys took what other people would not know what to do with, right. what other people would just like crumble and just give up on life with and just turn it around and make a positive out of it. You know, they, which anyone who knows them, which their TV personas are pretty much it too. They're, they'll turn something that's supposed to be serious and make a joke out of it, which is super awesome. Like, I feel like that's the, that's the mentality you got to have to make it through this world these days. Um, but the fact that he gives us smaller guys opportunities, you know, to meet our idols, to, you know, share a locker room with them, to be on these international pay-per-views with them, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I just give credit to Gallows for a lot that he's done for me. I've actually got the Talking Shop of Mania 2 shirt on under this little blazer thing. But uh, Oh, nice. Yeah. But, yeah the, those pay-per-views were definitely um, as crazy to film as you saw uh, on right. the pay-per-view. Right, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> it, it was just I, the, the role under Shed on Talking Shop 2, uh, I just remember thinking – I don't know if this is good for my career or not. Like I was just thinking that the whole career or the whole time we we're filming. I'm like, uh, well, it was a fun run while we lasted. And then in the first one, I had a small cameo in the uh, socially distancing battle Royal where I got eliminated by freight train, which super nice guy, freight train, uh, $5 wrestling. If anybody hasn't heard of freight train and then um, in the, uh, the main event, the um i was chewbacca in the grave that carl anderson hit me with a tombstone so it just oh really oh, wow. oh yeah yeah just That's little things like cool that opportunities yeah yeah it was weird because they're like hey climb in this hole and then whenever we say this pop up i was like all <laughs> right and then carl forgot the line so 
I never popped up. So we had to do it a couple <laughs> times. And uh, it was just good to hang out with those guys, though. Just Right. I can imagine. Yeah. Especially as a fan and, and as a, a, a rising star as you are. CW, yeah. did you watch uh, Talking Shop of Mania 1 or 2? I have not. I, wa- I be, rarely be watch any wrestling. I, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hardly ever. It, it depends. It has to be like WrestleMania or right. You know, an AEW. Yeah, because I, I I just don't watch wrestling like I used to. Yeah, no, I totally get it. Did you catch the Rumble by any chance? Just because that I haven't watched it yet. I got it, but I have, I've got it. I just haven't had a chance because oh, um, nice. I get yeah. Last night was pretty much a moving with moving my fiance down. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And then, you know, the party and all that, it was, it's just been a hectic weekend. So I plan on watching what you actually, when you, when we get done with this. It's oh, a, so we, we don't want to keep you. Yeah. It, it's a, <laughs> no, no, it's no, no, one no, of the, no, no rush. It's actually no rush. one of the best. I, I already know who won. It's, it's yeah. one of the best pay-per-views WWE's done in a while. I agree with you hundred percent. I, I lost my voice at home. I, I said that yeah. afterwards. I was like, this was good enough. Made me forget about everything happening right now yeah. for a That's little cool. bit. Yeah. So look forward to it. So, CW, I got a question for you. Uh, you used uh, what I guess would be considered like the Anderson style with obviously your own stuff mixed in, but the spine buster. How did you develop that? Did it just evolve along your career? It, it did. Um, I remember it's when I, I go back and look, seen some of my videos I was using when I started using it in like 94, 95. And it was, it, it was, bad. you know, I was holding on both arms and stuff like that. And yeah. I don't know where I developed the, where I could pop off and stand back up from it. It might've been an ECW or it might've been right before that. Cause I, I remember being able to hit balls Mahoney with it and he could bring me back <laughs> to my feet. Uh, Cause he has so much force generating, but right. um, it, it got to where I was just fine tuning it and getting the step and, telling people how to take it uh so you know one they wouldn't hurt me and i could get my maximum uh effort into it uh and then when everybody was and i kept telling people man you got the best spine buster it is and then they'd always pull up these spine buster things and you know they always told my arm having it and but that's it pretty much just being in the anderson and putting my own little spin to it and my athletic ability being able to stand back up to my feet from it yeah Bryce, how about you? Same question. Uh, for those who haven't seen a Bryce Cannon match, what could they come to expect? What's your style like in the ring? I, uh, I'm a super slow worker. Uh, I, love, I love entertaining people. So my focus is not only to win the match, of course, but it's to enter, entertain the fans. They came and paid to see a show. So why am I going to not involve them? If the fans aren't involved, the match is no good in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I, anyone that I ask or wrestle, you know, you can ask them. I'm super easy to work with just because I don't like calling a lot. Once you call a lot, that's when the match gets terrible. <laughs> like to, for me at least. Um, but you can definitely see the paddle getting used at some point. You know, the, <laughs> I've yeah. got, I've got my frat paddle. I've got now the belt or the championship. You can see that come into play. I'm a very sneaky person. Goes back to the Latino Heat, Chavo Guerrero style. I, right. I've I've used the Eddie Guerrero finish a few times in my career. So, um, but definitely, definitely, if you're wanting to get involved in the match, come to a Bryce Cannon match because if you're not involved, I'll make you get involved. CW, what do you think about that? Do you have any advice on like crafting that unique style? in the industry well, he, you know to be as young as Bryce is he's kind of hit a lot of it on the head with yeah. entertaining the fans making sure they're a part of it because the way I carried myself in my career was I always got told you know they even did articles on me where you could always come to ECW and you, the one person that would never have a bad match was CW because they always did the, they did the thing you can't spell ECW without CW um I wanted That's to be so the cool. guy that could I always wanted to be the guy that could I patted myself at the Bobby Eaton to where you could work, I could work Ric Flair or a broomstick and have a five-star match because I went out there and give the fans 110%. I've worked with my back blown out. Uh, I remember I worked Raven and New Jack in the same match one night in a singles match back-to-back with my back out oh on me. Louis, Louis, Louis Dangerously and Bill Wiles had to carry me to the gorilla position. I had to wrestle the match, and that's the infamous story where New Jack stapled the head of my <laughs> with a uh, – when he hit a <laughs> I've heard back. that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, but um, – 
I always looked at it that, you know, I grew up on, this is the way I look at it. I grew up on a, a dirt road and a horse farm with my parents, we borrowing tobacco. I, so I worked. So I know what it's like for my family right. and my grandparents and everybody around to work. So people that came to re watch wrestling, what it was like for them to work 40 hours a week, to pay that 10, 15, 20 bucks to come see ECW or to come watch, e you know, CW Anderson. And I wanted them to leave there with their money's worth because they took the time, their hard earned money and spent it for the family to come watch me and others entertain them. And I wanted to give them that entertainment, whether I got hurt or not, as long as they got that, I was good. Well, to, uh, to touch on something you mentioned, uh, you, you were talking about the, uh, you could either work Ric Flair or a broomstick. It's funny because I, I'll turn it to, to something that I've actually done. I actually put over a crutch. Uh, so oh, wow. <laughs> and, and, and I, I had uh, dislocated my patella, uh, in, a, in November and there was a January show and I had crutches and I mean, the fans just hated me. They, they always like, I, they would cheer for the crutch if I like dropped it or something because it wasn't helping me anymore. Like that, that's how the fans were. So then we, uh, I, which is dumb, but I wanted to get in the ring somehow and they were like, all right, well. And the promoter was just joking with me, but he was like, fine, get in the ring and take a bump from the crutch and get pinned. I was like, oh, I'll make this work. And the, the, the boys in the back, they were like, this is the best thing I've ever seen because the crowd was super into it. It, it, was, it was like a pre-show thing. It wasn't anything serious, but uh, it was just funny that you <laughs> mentioned that. you could yeah. either work a broomstick or a, a Ric Flair, mm -hmm. and it, it just brought that to my memory. I've wrestled several, several people in my career that needed crutches because I've carried them through the whole damn match. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm curious. I, I have heard the story, but just for those who haven't, the, uh, the New Jack incident that you brought up, when something like that happens from New Jack, I'm, I heard it was an accident, right? He didn't know. Mm -hmm. Do you get sympathy from someone like New Jack after that, though? Or what, what no, comes I get next? <laughs> New, Jack, New, New Jack and I today are still like this. And yeah. He, you know, we did a uh, WrestleCade thing a few years ago and it involved ECW because I, I helped the WrestleCade guys out um, and got New Jack and got, got a bunch of my ECW family there and we brought that story up. And it's funny, New Jack still apologizes for it, and, but he laughs about it. Wow. And, the, you know, for people that haven't heard the story, I wrestled Raven one night and I was still with the Dangerous Alliance. New Jack, come, New Jack's music hits after, I think I either beat Raven, I don't remember, I think Raven beat me. And... New Jack's music hits. He hits the ring. Bill Wiles and Louis Dangerous on the outside. I'm left in the middle with New Jack. And I always had so much fun wrestling New Jack. He was so much fun to work with. And I remember when we go, we're going over the stuff in the back, he worked Vic Grimes the night before. And he hated Vic Grimes. Still to the day. Right. Him. And so he would leave staples in for Vic Grimes. But with me, he took them out. And I'm sitting there, and as, as we're talking, he opens up the plunger. You know, he shakes them and gets them all out. And he sticks the plunger back in. Uh, we go out. We do the match. So I have no, and I thought he was going to do my forehead with it, but he lays me down and, and he spreads my legs, puts it on the head of my d and hits the plunger or hits it. And I think the plunger is the one that hit me. But when I look down, there's this half, inch and a half staple sticking out of the head of my d about that far. Oh my God. So I start screaming. I am, it's like a sharp pain because it hits. And then all of a sudden there comes the pain. So I'm screaming and new Jack, the music's playing. He's dancing around and he yeah. looks down. He's like, <laughs> He's like, get up, C Dub, next spot. Get up, C Dub, next spot. He thinks I'm selling. I look up at him. I said, New Jack, you have stapled my dick. And he looks down. He goes, Oh my God. And he's holding, he's like this. And he's keep trying to laugh. And he lays down beside me. And he says, I can't get up. I'm laughing so hard. And I rolled over. I said, Jack, I'm a paralyzed crab. I can't move. <laughs> <laughs> but he rolls me outside and he literally picks me up and pile drives me off the apron to a table on the floor. <laughs> and that's about when I pull it. My God, but we, we have talked about and laughed about that story. So, I mean, it's funny now, but at the time it wasn't funny. But oh, yeah. Still, I got no sympathy, none whatsoever. Yeah. One of those stories that just hurt me listening to it. Ugh. Yeah, seriously, I don't even <laughs> want to think about it. Uh, for both of you now, I'd love to talk about character development and, and your personas, uh, your individual personas. So, CW, how did you come about to adopt the Anderson name throughout your career? How did you form that character? The, the very first match I had back when you, when you asked me out, was I nervous and everything? Yeah. Uh, there, was a couple, there was a couple of guys there, uh, December 3rd, 1994. There was a couple of guys there 
running the Anderson gimmick. Pat Connors and Rocky Mills, they ran of course, the Anderson. They got permission from Gene Anderson, who's legitimately the only real Anderson. Well, Rocky was about my age. Rocky was 50 at the time. And Pat was in his mid to late 30s. And he was looking somebody to take over the Anderson thing and tag with him up and down the Mid-Atlantic. So they saw me wrestle. At the time, I only had a goatee. I looked legitimately like the big boss man when I was in my early 20s because I just had the goatee and had a little bit of hair. So Pat sat me down here in Rocky, and he asked me what I want to be an Anderson. Um, give me the whole spiel about being the Anderson. And, you know, growing up, I hated the Anderson because I always loved Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA and guys yeah. like that. So I was like, yeah, sure. Hell, why not? I didn't know what I was going to do anyway. So – he said, well, think of a three-letter name. He was Pat. You had Ole and Arn. So, for the first few weeks, I said, damn, I tried to come up with Ike and Cal. I couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> and my former baseball coach, who was also turned to be a wrestling manager, his name was Randy Driver. I was sitting with him one day, and I said, Mr. Randy, I can't come up with anything. And uh, to be an Anderson, I can't come up with a name. He said, I would just use your initials, call you CW. So, it just kind of stuck from that. And just then I started watching Anderson films and – my mentality got to where how the Andersons were when they walked out, you're the baddest man out there. You can't whoop my ass. You can't out wrestle me. So when I walked out and I carried it through my career still to the day, when I walked through those curtains, I transformed. That's when I got the, you know, the whole Rockwaller transforming thing from Chris Wright to CW Anderson. Yeah. Because that's the character. I, when I walked through those curtains, that's who I am. You can't whoop my ass. You damn sure ain't going to outwork me. Cause even at 50 years old, I can still go. Um, and that's how my mind plays when I'm in there. That's the development that I took. And was there any uh, opinions given to you from Arn or, or Ole over the years? You know, I never really met Arn until I signed with WWE. And when we did that Disney fight ECW. Um, yeah. <laughs> when, when we uh, – I got to meet and talk to Arn then. I talked to Ole. I got the blessing from him – in early 2000, in early 2000s, I had just come back from Japan. I flew in that morning, went to a show, and they brought him in to give me the blessing. And he was so miserable at that show. He didn't want to do the, the thing with me. All he wanted to do was sit there and pedal, pedal that stupid book of his. Um, so I finally, they made me go over and talk to him while he was sitting at his table and cut a promo on him and, you know, to get the blessing from him. And he finally stood up and did this. And, you know, it wasn't until recently that, Arn on his podcast put me over and said I deserved the Anderson name. You know, I did it justice. And then I saw oh, him. Nice. I saw him last, not last year, but year before last at WrestleCade when they brought him in and walked up and said, and you know, I talked to him for, for about 15, 20 minutes. And I said, Arn, I can't thank you enough, you know, for putting me over on the podcast because my whole career, you were the Anderson I looked up to. And when I got to the power plant, I was scared to death to call myself an Anderson because, you know, he was still at WCW. And he's like, CW, look, none of us are really Andersons. We got the blessing from Gene. You're just as much as Anderson than I am. He said, your work speaks for itself. He says, and I'm honored that you're carrying on the Anderson legacy. Wow. That is quite the blessing. That's great. That's good yeah. to hear. Uh, Bryce, tell us about the frat boy persona and, and how it continues to evolve throughout your career. All right. Yeah. So when I first started, I was just that generic little prick. Uh, I had the E Lucha tights, the, well, that looked like the edge gimmick. Like it was yeah. bad. It was, it was terrible, but um, it, it was full circle. Once again, it's, it's crazy. This career that I've had because uh, my debut match was at AWN in Fort Valley, Georgia. And okay. so uh, there was a group there. They're called the undeniable. Uh, it's a group uh, here in Georgia called uh, with Matt Hankins, Shane Marks, and uh, Brian Blaze. And those guys are seriously the ones that have helped me um, get to where I am today as far as character-wise. Um, Brian said, you know what you need, kid? He's like, especially if you want to get this uh, douchey frat boy gimmick over, he goes, you need two shirts like the olden days. And I was like, Okay. Okay, so so I got home and I, I looked in my closet and like, what goes with two shirts? What what can I do with two shirts? And then I looked in my drawer and there were some. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, with but the chubby shorts, like the super short. I'm I'm not. 
Like, like yeah. But I could imagine. Are, oh, okay, okay. Just a preppy boy, like short shorts, the khaki shorts and stuff like that. Uh, it's a brand called Chubby's. And that, okay. I mean, honestly, that, that's the shorts that I wear on a day-to-day basis. It doesn't matter if it's cold, rainy, whatever. I'm in Chubby's. And so I was like, okay, so all I'm going to do with this gimmick is be me up to 10,000. And I know that's the generic answer. Everybody says, oh, my wrestling persona is me bumped up, you know? Yeah. But for most of us, that's what it is. And that's what I feel like if you're yourself, you can't be any better than yourself, you know? And so what I did was I literally went through all of my clothes, like, boom. And then I put on the loafers and I was like, okay, I'm starting to get a, uh, a look that people are just going to absolutely hate. Cause, cause me, I'm usually just a t-shirt type of guy with shorts. Yeah. But uh, I showed up to the next AWN event with the short shorts and double pop collars and brian just looked at me he goes oh no i've created a monster (laughs) as soon as soon as i walked out i just got major heat just by the way that i look i looked i had the i had like the ray-ban aviators i had double pop collar the shorts i had the belt and i worked in loafers for a good while until i blew my knee out and it's funny because people were always like oh you're gonna blow your ankles out wearing loafers uh wrestling and everything but uh my knee blew out on a uh on an enziguri of all things i got hit with an enziguri <laughs> step back and my knee just busted but um from from the from there uh that injury is kind of what has helped me progress the gimmick um because i had a lot of downtime i was out for four months and i had a lot of downtime to think okay uh i need i need gear that's a lot safer to wear I need yeah. gear that's, uh, you know, that that looks different. So from there, I just started thinking, what do I like? And it, and it took me back to whenever I was a teenager, like I said earlier, whenever I would look at guys' gear on TV, like what what did I like seeing? And I liked the the rhinestone look. So I hit up uh, one of my one of my friends, and I got him to uh, redo the White Claw logo for me, and uh, make it, you know, a Bryce Cannon frat boy logo. And so I sent it to someone that I found um, making gear. And uh, I was like, okay, I want crushed velvet with this logo. And I just want it bedazzled. I want it bedazzled out. As many rhinestones as you can put on there. Hell, I hate you right now just listening to you talk about (laughs) (laughs) it. Oh, well, then you're going to hate this especially. And then so I – I was sitting there thinking, okay, I've already purchased gear. I've already purchased boots. I've got knee pads coming. What can I do with it for, for my entrance wear? What, what can I do? And then I thought the letterman's jacket, let's go with the authentic letterman's jacket. So I order one and I send it to my gear maker. I'm like, Hey, this is what I want. So we put a BC on the front and rhinestone that bad boy out. I put my logo on the back wow. um, and that thing, <laughs> It, it hits light and it's like, oh my gosh. Like, okay. <laughs> but from there on, I mean, I still wear the double pop collars. Um, right. The, and I mean, it's just the, the gimmick has evolved like so much since I've started. I mean, I've, I've officially got, got the blonde hair going. I know oh, you, you got the blonde. It. I know wow. you can't see it. And, uh, but cause blonde it's enough lighting. shines through. Yeah. yeah. But I, I just dyed my hair um, to, you know, just to add a little something different now. Like I'm always yeah. looking uh, at ways of how can I make this gimmick more out outlandish and absurd? Honestly, that's the word that I look for. And then I brought in the paddle and the paddle has gotten over more than anything. If, if people see me with that paddle, they yell at the ref, get that thing out of here. Cause they know <laughs> what's uh, CW. Have you ever heard of uh, the, the man in Georgia? He's a legend uh, iceberg. I, yes, I actually I have. Uh, Chastain, I think, is his last name, Eddie yeah. Chastain. Yeah, uh, he he is the one that got helped me get the paddle over. He was like, because we were doing a spot with him at AWN, and he he told us he goes, um, I I want you to use that paddle on me. We we're getting this paddle over. He goes, I know I'm a hardcore guy, but I'm bumping for your paddle. And I was like, no, you don't need to do that. You're, you don't wrestle anymore, really, man. Like you don't need to take any bumps. He goes, Oh no, brother, I'm bumping for your paddle. As the moment I did that, I was getting messages 
the next day. I, I did a Larry Otto show the next night and people were booing me just because of that particular spot. And I had the paddle and people were like, even some of the brothers were like, man, why would you hit iceberg with the paddle? Yada, yada. <laughs> so the paddle has definitely uh, helped progress the gimmick. And now it's just, where do we go next? Like, yeah. but what, what's the next step of the frat boy? which we've already kind of done a little thing and people have started calling me the frat daddy. So we'll see what we oh, can the do frat with that. Daddy. All right. Yeah. So it, it is evolving quickly. Obviously it's a great, it sounds like a great persona. It reminds me of like somebody like the Miz or Ziggler or something. Definitely. Man, seems like that I, direction. I have, uh, wow. Yeah. I appreciate that right there. Just cause the Miz that, that was my guy growing up. Like the, I, it reminds me of like, yeah. Early day Miz definitely yeah. like 20, he, you know, 2006, 2007. I've, yeah. I've literally followed Miz for 14 years now. So Miz, oh, wow. Miz, Miz is my, like, if, end all be off. That, if I could work somebody, it would be Miz. I would just love to get in the ring with him. He, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's my guy. I'm a Miz Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, CW, I want to get into when. So, you left uh, the power plant, and then did you immediately go to, to ECW from there? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, happenstance because one of my students who I was traveling up and down the road with wrestling, his name was Toad. His real name is Curtis White. At the end of WCW, he tagged with PG-13, uh, against the young, what was the young dragons? And he worked as frog. So that was him a little bit. Okay. But he got a tryout because he was Lodi's tag team partner. So he got a try at ECW one day and, it was a Sunday, the Saturday night before he and I worked the public enemy. So he was going to go down and he literally drug me down to the tryout because I didn't want to go. Uh, I'm just very introvert, new things, scare me type person. So I didn't want to go. I was very nervous, but he said, look, come with me. He says, you know, you're really good friends with Steve Carino. You'll get to uh, hang out with him and see him. You know, you might get in the ring. If you don't, at least you can, you know, politic a little bit and get your name out there. And that was right after J.J. Dillon and Paul Orndorff had told me at the power plant that I didn't have what it takes to make it at WCW. Uh, so that Sunday, I went down there with him. He got in the ring. He rolled around with Angel, who was ended up being you know, Angel from the Baldies at, uh, later. Okay. And uh, Nova was running the tryouts. He did a little five-minute thing, and it kind of didn't go so well with him. And when he got done, Nova leans out and looks at me, and I'm standing there talking to Simon Diamond or uh, – and uh, Steve Carino, because we all knew each other. And he looked at me. He says, Chris, you got your gear? I'm like, well, yeah, it's in the car. So he said, run and get it. Let's see what you can do. So I ran to my car, got my gear, got in the ring. He threw Simon in the ring with me. We did a little five-minute match. Uh, when I got done with it, um, I just got out. I thanked him. And he, you know, he said, you got really good timing. And I hear somebody from the seats say, yell to Bill Alfonso to get the ball guy back in the ring. When I looked over <laughs> there, it's it's Paul Heyman. He's sitting there with Taz and the Dudleys, and they're watching the tryout. Oh, wow. Wow. So Fon Fonzie looks at me and goes, Daddy, he wants you back in the ring. So I get back in the ring, and he starts throwing guys at me for like the next hour, hour and a half. Um, I'm wrestling all these different guys. The doors are getting ready to open. I go in the back. I'm in the bathroom by myself cleaning myself up because I was hitting the turnbuckle and the bumping so hard that I was bleeding from the inside. I was spitting up blood. I remember the door opening. And I look, and it's Paul Heyman walking up to me. He sticks his hand out to me, and he says, hey, I'm Paul Heyman. It's nice to meet you. And I shook his hand. I said, hey, Paul, my name's Chris Wright. He said, Chris, where are you wrestling that now? I said, so, you know, I'm a student at the power plant. He said, asked me if I was on contract there. And I said, no, sir, they don't. They told me that I didn't really have what it takes to make it there. Uh, he said, well, what's your wrestling name? I said, C.W. Anderson. He goes, I knew it. He says, you look like Arn. You had the left punch, the spine buster. He goes, before the end of the night, don't leave before I speak to you. And I was like, yes, sir. He said, more than welcome to hang out in the back. So I'm hanging out in the back. Show's getting ready to start. And Jim Mala walks up to me. He was one of the refs. And he says, are you CW? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, Paul's in the dress room. He wants to speak to you. So he takes me back. I walk in the dress room. Paul's sitting there with Vito, La Vito LaGrasa, Skull Von Crush, and Danny Doyne and Roadkill. He introduces me to him. He says, you're tagging with Vito against Danny and Roadkill. Your third match. Welcome to ECW. That's how I kind of got my job. That is so cool. I love the whole inside perspective. Uh, before you got to ECW, uh, being an ECW original, were you? did you ever get extreme before you got to ECW? Was that all new to you? Because they had such a unique attitude and everything at the time. 
I was such a mark for ECW. That's kind of the style I did. My buddy Toad and I did. I mean, we were doing Frankensteiners off the top rope through the tables on the floor. Uh, crazy stuff like that. We were doing you no know, chairs and chairs over the face, the Sabu spots, because I was really yeah. a big mark for Sabu. The very first time I ever watched ECW, um, we, the satellite I had, because I live so far in the country, was one of the huge ones that was like 20 some feet in the air and it turned and i remember getting msg and set and uh ecw was on the first thing i'd see is sabu doing a pullover to the outside and i was hooked so man i was doing all that crazy shit i was wrestling you know old school wrestling but man with an extreme style so it wasn't really that new to me um but you know doing it four nights a week took its toll on me getting yeah. blasted from balls mahoney on a nightly basis <laughs> you had mentioned you did backyard wrestling did, did you used to do the hardcore stuff when you did the backyard or no it was it was right it was only for a, a few months and it was an actual it was a ring that an indie wrestler that lived across the street from one of the guys i played baseball with had it was his ring he set it up in the backyard and he was like teaching guys moves and stuff and they were putting on little shows for the for the little community uh so it was only like a couple months that i did it and it wasn't until god in like the mid 90s that i started doing that when i was tagging with pat we and I was trained Lodi and Toad. We four were traveling around doing the hardcore stuff, going through tables, uh, crazy stuff. Like we'd see something on ECW and we'd try it. Uh, we'd double stack tables and they'd put me through double stack tables. I mean, anything we saw on ECW, we wouldn't try. We wouldn't practice it. We just like, all right, we're gonna go out there and do it. What's the dumbest shit we would ever do? <laughs> That's not to practice it. But you know, you're you're in your twenties and you're you feel invincible. So we'd go out there and yeah. do the crazy stuff like that. Is there one specific spot that you remember from ECW? I'm sure there's so many, but that you'd call the craziest spot that you took while you while with your time there. Um, I got two. The first one was one the night I got over with the ECW crowd at the arena. I let Super Crazy do that spot to me. He Frankenstein me off the top rope, threw a table on the floor, um, oh, wow. then threw me in and moonsaulted back in to pin me so he could be the <laughs> like number one contender for the, the, the TV belt or something along those lines is what it was for. And the craziest one, it was my I quit match. And if you ever go back and watch it, when Tommy picks me up on the second rope for the Spicoli driver, I am yeah. holding on to Tommy's pants for dear life because I am petrified because I'm scared of heights. So that was the craziest one. I'm sitting there and I'm holding on. Yeah. <laughs> and as he's picking me up, you see, he leans down like this and he and he screams, not yet, because he thinks I'm trying to go. <laughs> uh, but I am scared to death. And I still remember the day being, feeling the rotation going through. And I felt at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I'm all right. Bam, we went right through the table. That was probably wow. the craziest one. Bryce, do you ever get extreme in your matches? Oh, no. Oh, no, I'm a winner. No. Yeah. I'm a winner. <laughs> No, I, I mean, I'll take the paddle, and I, uh, I've i been in a first blood match, um, which I think me and CW actually worked a promotion uh, in Georgia together, Stranglehold. I don't want to mention it, but the Stranglehold, it was a, a – I don't even remember where it was. It was somewhere near Six Flags in Georgia. Um, but they, they had this – Oh, my they, God. Yeah, it was the um, – The Rumble. It was like – 400 people there in the back, right? Yeah. And well, it was like 12, pe 12, 12 people, people in the, in the crowd. crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I remember that night. Yeah. yeah. They hyped the show up so much. And then nobody. God, no, there was so many people. You had to do an interview. You walked out. You did an interview. Then you're right beside the ring. Your music played and you got in the ring. Yeah. Unless you were in the rumble. We were all standing in order or trying to get in order. And then they're like, I remember the rumble. Yeah. Oh gosh. Cluster is what it was. And so yeah, we're, we're all, mess. We're, wow. <laughs> we're, we're all lined up because what he was trying to do is beat WWE's Royal rumble, uh, record or whatever. It was like a six. I don't know how many, it was a lot of people, but oh, it was, really? it so was, it was just, like, uh, it, it started out with a hundred. It was like 101 people he was going to have in there. Yeah. And oh, so who I are remember, these people? Friends at some point. Right. I mean, oof. I don't, I don't even know how I, I got roped into it, <laughs> but <laughs> I remember, pre, I remember pre, it was you, it was, uh, July 7th, something, it was something crazy. It was July 5th and 6th or something like that. I remember Preston Quinn and I drove down from, yeah. to Georgia for that show. I yeah, remember that. They had like 
Animal, Bob Orton, Tony Atlas, like they had everyone there. And I remember Animal was ticked off after his match because he was just putting legends in the ring with just these no named people yeah. that were terrible. There was a sign in beforehand that basically nobody showed up. We're all yeah. just walking around talking uh, to each other. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't know if uh, you were in there for it, but there was actually one fan in there at the time. And me and my uh, tag team partner at the time, Eddie Honcho, we were we were fixing to walk out and the fan just collapses right in front of me. Had a had like a seat or just fainted because she's Oh no, I was I, I think I'd already bounced out there eating or something. I don't <laughs> yeah, remember that part. Yeah, because she saw Ricky Morton and I mean they just bam <laughs> right in front of me and I was like, uh Oh my God. And I was a heel, so I was like, I'm staying in character. So I just looked and <laughs> walked around the limp body. It was just like, well, I'm on my way. <laughs> but but this rumble was terrible. Lazy. Yeah. We we thought we were individually uh going out. And so we were trying to get in order. And then all of a sudden you hear, All right, first ten people go to the ring. We're just like, like Ten people. What? Yeah. And after he had made videos for everybody like entrance videos for everybody and everything like that. He was just like, all oh, right, yeah. first 10 of you get out there. No order. He tried, but it was, he tried, but it was a huge disaster. It sounds it like a bad. lot of effort. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Um, that well, is. What was the question you asked? I'm sorry. I, uh... I just said if you ever got extreme, but you know, that sounds extreme enough right there. Yeah. That sounds like a, a hell of a time. Before we uh, wind it down, I'd love to know, CW, your time in WWE. Uh, I know it wasn't as long as your time in, in ECW, but how was that? I hated, I hated being, you know, I signed under the premise that Tommy and Paul were going to run that ECW. That's when Tommy called and said, WWE wants to hire you, uh, which I thought he was screwing with me because he does stuff like that. I mean, you're talking to a guy <laughs> that when we fight out in the crowd, he would pick up hot dogs off the floor and eat them yeah. to make me throw up. So, <laughs> uh, oh, that's terrible. Sounds like it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so ECW crowd, I thought wow. it was, I, I thought he was joking, but once I got there, the very first show was at the ECW Arena. I worked Sabu. You know, Vince saw the show. He didn't like it because it, he didn't like how the house was, even though it was standing room only. He didn't like the lighting, so he took it over and started putting his WWE guys in there, and it was it was a nightmare. And there was, you know, Francine and I, when we'd get there, we would find out if we were working. If we weren't working, then we were leaving. We'd, we'd sneak out and leave. Because, you know, you get there at 11 o'clock in the morning and you don't leave till 11 o'clock at night. And until the show starts, you're not doing shit but standing around. And then yeah. you have to watch what you're saying at WWE. You can't, you know, at ECW, we were a family and we laughed and joked and carried on and stuff. There's none of that going on. So, and plus it wasn't ECW. He just, he tried to, he tried to kill it and destroy it. Um, but it was not ECW. And the day John Laranatis called me and said they were letting me go, I went, sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and he was kind of like uh yeah okay maybe you know later down the road we can bring you back and nope i'm good i said can i go back to oh, japan wow. he said yeah i know you like being there he said just don't go to you know to tna because we have a no compete clause with them i'm like you won't have a problem with that oh do, wow did they really know that's interesting how yeah, long did that last to, just a certain it was not, it was a 90 day no compete clause oh, and i was gotcha. like cool okay i could go back to japan immediately um, but I just couldn't go to TNA. You know, they weren't interested in me at the time anyway, right. so that was not right. a big deal. But yeah, yeah, that was a miserable experience. Wow. Sorry to hear that. But uh, <laughs> to ask to go to Bryce now, I'd love to hear. Uh, last question for you, your future. What do you see? Do you have any long-term or short-term goals? Um, well, I think everybody's goal in the business is to make it. Um, yeah. But I – I'm the type of person I live a day at a time. I don't want to get ahead of myself because the moment you get ahead of yourself is the moment you lose everything. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I try to stay super humble and whatever opportunities that are thrown my way, you know, I mean, I just try to knock them out of the park when I can, but as far as like, um, where I would want to go, if, if I did get signed right now, I would say impact just because I feel like impact is, I feel like it's a good starting point. Um, right yeah. now because I mean they they're getting bigger by the moment uh, it's really and, great. yeah and I mean hopefully fans watch their impact plus stuff because Larry Otto's just now getting to where we're uh, doing impact plus tapings so I feel like fans would kind of you know already kind of know who Bryce Cannon is and yeah you know, totally. a little bit about us um, so I think it'd be cool to kind of be like oh well I was on their streaming device first on an indie show and now I'm here and then get my name out there 
from there. Uh, but the thing with me is I don't want to make it off of someone I know, which is mainly what this business is. It's all about who you know, not what you know. Um, but at the yeah. same time, it's like whatever opportunity runs my way, I just want to swing it out of the park. Um, who you know gets you in the door. What exactly. you know keeps you there. Exactly. And that I've actually heard that said from uh, uh, several guys. Um, but I mean, the opportunities that I've gotten already in uh, the three years that I've been working is incredible to me. It's mind blowing. So, um, like I said, I mean, short term goals is just to take whatever's put in front of me and, you know, keep the ball rolling and get better and better after time. You know, Bryce, uh, my, one of my advice is it's a, attend seminars, mm -hmm. especially ones that are ones that are run by reputable people yeah. and got reps saying like AML's got one. We got another three day one coming up in January, uh, June 25th, 6th and 7th. I suggest you be there for myself. Uh, Rudy, uh, sh what is the guy that's leading it? I just blanked on his name, but Preston Quinn, who's my extreme horseman brother. Uh, holy crap. I'm blanking on the guy that's running it. That's helping run it. But anyway, it's, it's a three day seminar. Um, hotels and stuff are, are in the price as a shuttle. I mean, it's definitely something you can attend. Um, get with me after this, okay. uh, you know, go through Facebook, get with me and, uh, I'll give you more information on it, but you don't want to miss that one and any seminar you can sh get to okay. and get your name out there. You know, it's that whole thing out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Okay. Definitely will. I appreciate yeah. that. Yes, sir. Yeah, that was awesome. That, uh, it was actually going to be my last question for you, CW, any advice so you covered that. Now, my next question, last question for you is, uh, you mentioned that you put that retirement video out, but that was just to please your mother as we learned here. So what could we expect? Actually, actually it wasn't to please her. It was to okay. please somebody else. It was to please somebody else who ended up didn't deserving the air I breathe with. Um, oh, so, but it was, I was, you know, I tell people and they can go on my Instagram and see this, my testimony once I turn my life over to God and, uh, how, how things have changed for me and how things have gotten better. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, I, I got an amazing woman in my life now who's, you know, she's my manager of valet. She's the Elizabeth to my savage. And, um, oh, that's nice. she's, she's so cool. And she pushes me, whether it's been working out, whether it's being in the Bible more, but she wanted, she's one of the people that said, you need to do this. George South, who's a good, really good friend of mine that when I, broke down on him when I told him everything that was going on. He said, CW Wrestling needs you. These young guys need you. He said, you're still in amazing shape. You still can go. He said, I, he said, he said, hey, buddy, who am I going to wrestle if you retire? So um, <laughs> it, it's, I'm looking forward to being back in the ring and getting back. And I wish I'd have never done it. But, you know, rock bottom being a college education, we learn so much. Uh, and it, I think it made me who I am right now. So yeah. if I can give back to all the guys, because that's one of the things about being in this business. I want to leave this business better off than what I found it. Right. That's my whole thing. And as long as I can wrestle and not do this business any injustice, I'm still going to, I'm going to be here. There will be no more retiring. There'll be none of that stuff. So. Yeah. And that is great to hear. I can't wait. To, I'm looking forward to both of your futures, Impact Plus and CW. You as well. So thank you both for being here. That finishes us off for this episode. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bless your daddy. Book and man feel good. I tell my people and my brothers and sisters, don't you dare, don't you dare miss online. Rewind, recap, relive. Oh, yeah.